Good evening, everybody. My primary function is to tell you to turn off your mobile phones. My second function is to welcome to UCL for yet another brilliant event. My third function is to talk to you at drinks afterwards just outside. My fourth function is to hand this mic to Colin Burns. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Robin, for that um, brief introduction. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks to UCL uh, and uh, to IPAN uh, for organising this event, and Stephen Jones, who also runs IPRI Pro Bono, uh, for putting it together uh, uh, this evening. Uh, the question that we're asking this evening is, can the IP system s serve small businesses better? Now, you might think there's an easy answer to that question. Uh, but before we jump to conclusions, can I just uh, reflect on a couple of things? First of all, why am I here? Well, like many people who've stayed in IP law for a good while, once my legal career got going, I settled into a practice fighting multi-zillion dollar patent cases for global multinational corporations. Now, that kind of litigation more closely resembles a Cecil B. DeMille movie like The Ten Commandments uh, than most small business disputes. You can just imagine Charlton Heston, or possibly Robin Jacob, as Moses. Uh, and when you are uh, a very junior barrister, you start out as the second spear carrier, mostly off camera. You then move on to a speaking part, in which you get killed in the first half hour. Uh, a few years after that, you might get the lead in a B-movie, all of your own. Uh, and finally, as a QC, you, you get top billing. Now, the point, of course, is that that part of the intellectual property system has got very little to do with small businesses. And I believe there is a discussion to be had uh, about the sort of IP career trajectory that I've described and how it relates to what we're discussing this evening. But I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Now, another bit of scene setting, <coughs> which I want to do, uh, is to focus on small businesses in relation to IP in general. Why do they matter? Why do small businesses matter? Well, I would suggest they matter a very great deal. Uh, in its broadest sense, intellectual property is doing its job most acutely when it's in a David and Goliath situation. After all, if an innovator or a creator had the economic strength to prevent other people from pinching their ideas, you wouldn't need it to be intellectual property, a property right, at all. The key, as I've tried to emphasize, is the word property. The point of a property right is that others don't get to trespass on your property, whoever you are as the owner of that property. It's still a trespass, whether the owner of the property is a prince or a pauper. So what we're discussing here is something of real importance. It's about access to justice. And you can write down all the laws you like, but the law is a sham if it, if it pretends to give people rights, which they have no practical way of enforcing. And also, and just as important, the law is also a sham if it sets boundaries and gives people defences to claims by others if those people with the defences are unable to protect themselves from spurious claims by the princes with the power and the money. So if we want to pat ourselves on the back and tell ourselves that we work in the most interesting and worthwhile area of the law, which I think we do, uh, we need to remember that we can't all call each other fine fellows, that's gender neutral fellows, by the way, uh, unless we all do our bit to make the system work for everybody. And it's a moral issue, but there's also a utilitarian side to all of this. All the big businesses around the world today were small businesses once, What's more, small business represents a huge piece of our economy and our society. So if we want to live in a vibrant place, then we need to make sure that the environment is right for them as well. Now, in fact, I think there's quite a lot to celebrate uh, about all of this in this jurisdiction. The Intellectual Property Enterprise Court is firmly established as a forum in which small and medium-sized enterprises can bring and defend IP claim claims without breaking the bank. His Honour Judge Richard Hakon has done more than anyone else to drive home the message that cost-effective IP litigation really is possible and desirable. And I mean that. I know I was there before him, but he's been there far, far longer than I was. I can't believe that anyone today does doubt 
that that is true, that you can do that, but if they do doubt it, they only have to be referred to Richard's work in IPEC. And in addition to the multi-track IPEC, we have the IPEC small claims track, and it's achieved something that no one thought was even possible. Access to justice for IP rights holders in cases with the very smallest of values. And one of our uh, panel today is District Judge Charlotte Hart, who's been at the heart of that work since it started in, a th I'm going to get this wrong now, I think it was 2013 or maybe 14. I think 13. 13. And at the start, Charlotte had two colleagues, DJ Janet Hart, who's now retired, and then District Judge, now Her Honour Judge Melissa Clark. No, but Charlotte's the one who stayed the course. And I want to take this opportunity, I do, to say pu public thank you to all three judges of the Small Claims Track, but particularly Charlotte, who has remained dedicated to this project throughout. And thank you for that. And in fact, as Charlotte knows, uh, <coughs> there is real pressure on the district bench and the civil justice system in general. We do not have enough full-time DJs in our country. You know, I recently arranged for civil justice, and in fact this is a High Court Judge Mary Stacey, uh, to work with family jurisdiction on a joint project to try as hard as we can to encourage people to apply to become salaried district judges. And I'm not going to pass off on the opportunity to look you all in the eye. Seriously, though, uh, and you should think about it. It is an incredible job. Uh, I should say there are part-time deputies, uh, particularly, of course, in IPEC and the small claims track, uh, but they can be stretched too. But civil justice in general, and IP in particular, just cannot be a purely part-time affair, and so I'd encourage you to think about it. Incidentally, smaller cases does not mean easier cases. The legal problems are just the same and can be every bit as challenging as they are in the higher courts, sometimes more so. The district bench really do some pretty challenging work. Don't assume that the hardest cases are the ones highest up the tree. Now, <clears throat> I want to say something about the value of the IP cases on the small claims track. They are of very low value, as I said, but it is a relative statement. In a legal system in which one can have cases where the costs of running the case are in the tens of millions of pounds, and there are cases like that, the idea that an IP claim for 400 pounds exists might seem remarkable. But as everyone who works with small claims in the civil justice system knows, and everyone involved in civil justice as a whole certainly ought to know, to someone who brings a £400 small claim of any kind, photographer or anything else, um, that amount of money is important. Nobody goes to court for that kind of money unless it matters. <clears throat> so we need to have an IP system and a court system as a whole, which makes it possible for businesses of all sizes and individuals to bring and defend their claims. And we need to have a system for getting access to good legal advice, which tries as hard as it can to cater for that as well. And that brings me back to the 1950s movies like the Ten Commandments. As I said, I mentioned the start of my legal career. But at that time, as well as having a few rather well-paid bit parts in some big productions, I was lucky enough also to get some work on small cases in the original incarnation of IPEC, the then Patents County Court. And as a two or three year, four year experienced barrister, people like me and Ian Purvis and people like that, we were running cases, handling trials, cross-examining witnesses, getting it right, that was Ian Purvis, getting it wrong, that was me, <coughs> and generally learning a huge amount. But at the same time, clients who could never have afforded to litigate in the traditional high court at the time were getting access to justice. And it's what I call a win-win. And it applies in spades to working pro bono. Every lawyer, no matter how senior or how junior, has expertise and skill which someone who can't afford it could use. And every lawyer has something to learn from helping that sort of person, whether it's pro bono or pro not very mucho. A litigant will always benefit from that help. In the business and property courts in the Rolls Building, there's a scheme called CLIPS. It's a sort of pro bono doc brief system. In other words, the barristers are there uh, available in court on the day and litigants in person with no lawyers come to court and the barristers will help them. The intellectual property barristers, who I routinely tell ought to do CLIPS, always say to me they don't want to do it, not because they don't believe in it, but because they wouldn't feel comfortable doing the sort of general chancery work, often housing and insolvency, that this would involve, and they think they wouldn't be able to help. 
they are profoundly mistaken. Even if all the lawyer does is listen to the litigant's story and ask questions to straighten it out, work out what happened, and turn it into a coherent case, that has significant value. All barristers, regardless of their legal skill, would then be able to stand up if they'd done that and explain the now clarified story to the court. The objectivity of the narrator telling someone else's story has enormous power to clarify everything, and everybody can do that. And in IP, we just cannot fairly expect small businesses which have enough to do to look after themselves in this complex world of intellectual property. They need your help. Thank you very much. Well, Robin had, uh, had one job, which was to introduce uh, Colin Burst, uh, but he didn't give him his full uh, sort of um, moniker as Lord Justice of Appeal and uh, Deputy Head of Civil Justice, uh, apparently now. I'm not sure who, who the head of civil justice is, but there's another one. But anyway, the, the master of the roles. So he's deputy master of the roles, I suppose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that right? <laughs> anyway, the point is, you, you've heard that from somebody who's very well qualified to speak um, on the subject. And it's, I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, he started off by saying, why am I here? And the answer was, because I asked him to be here, and I'm very grateful uh, that out of all the busy things that you're doing, that you uh, agreed to come along and give us that perspective on, uh, as you said, the sort of cases that perhaps didn't form your regular diet, uh, at least when you were in practice. It may have been a different story when you were in charge of IPEC and you saw some different types of cases then. But anyway, Thank you so much for, 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 for that, to set the scene for us. Um, and thank you all very, very much for coming to this seminar today and to UCL uh, and IBIL for, for putting it on. Um, and, and especially to Lisa and, and, and Lynn for everything they've done uh, to, 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 put, to put this on today. Um, thanks also to IPAN, the Intellectual Property Awareness Network for its support. And I should say, for anybody who's not familiar with that, uh, that IPEN, IPAN uh, brings together organizations and individuals drawn from business, commerce, education, and the IP professions uh, all over the UK, all committed to the importance and understanding of IP as a vital ingredient for innovation and success uh, for businesses, whether they're large or small businesses. And if you're interested in joining IPAN, you can find out more from its website. I think the details were in the, uh, in the uh, uh, link for this seminar, and you'd be very welcome as a member. Um, and as has been mentioned, as well as being uh, a board member of IPAN, I'm also uh, the chair of IP Pro Bono, uh, and that's a joint initiative of a number of IP organizations, SEPA, Charles Institute of Patent Attorneys, SITMAR, trademark attorneys, uh, the Intellectual Property Lawyers Association, solicitors, uh, the IP Bar and, and, and the Law Society itself. And IP Pro Bono's mission was to find uh, legal support for individuals and small businesses who couldn't otherwise afford to meet the costs of professional representation. Now, doing that, uh, work, working with IP Pro Bono for the last uh, five years or so, six years probably, it's given me some, some interesting new perspectives on how the IP system works for individuals and SMEs. And I'm hoping this seminar will address some of those issues. Uh, as Colin's already said, both from the perspective of rights holders who find it difficult to enforce their rights, but also from the other side of that coin where individuals or businesses may be unable to defend themselves effectively in relation to allegations made against them. So the format for today is, first of all, after Colin's brilliant keynote, uh, we're going to hear from representatives of the small business community. Um, Isabel Duran is the chief executive of the Association of Photographers, and she has over 20 years of experience in the creative industries. 
Sorry, that's what it said on your uh, things. Pardon me. And Neil Sharpley is the chair of the Justice Policy Unit at the Federation of Small Businesses. So they're going to start by letting us know their views on how the IFB system serves this particular community. Isabel, I think you're going first. So. Here we go. So good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I'm actually standing in for a colleague of mine, Nick Dunmer, who also works for the Association of Photographers. So as, of course, the introduction, I'm the current CEO of the Association of Photographers, representing over 3,500 members, with a majority of uh, professional photographers as part of that membership. I'm also a board director for the British Copyright Council, representing artistic works and a contributor to the IPO's Research Expert Advisory Group. And previously, I was actually chair of the British Association of Picture Libraries and Agencies. And so, yes, there are, in fact, over 100 picture libraries and agencies and thousands of professional photographers operating in the UK. So, can the IP system serve small businesses better? Obviously, that's the, the title of, of this evening's seminar. So all visual creators face the issue of copyright infringement and I can't in a way stress that enough in, in that respect. I think where we changed from a physical environment to the online environment we've literally seen an explosion of copyright infringement taking place. I think it's also important to say that obviously professional photographers and image makers are all small business owners. And, and of course, they make their living from it, the images they produce. Secondly, of course, while intellectual property is not always viewed as a tangible element such as, say, property is, it has significant economic value to the creator or rights holder. An industry report on photographic copyright infringement back in 2019, so this was pre-COVID, published by BAPLA, my former trade association, 93% of respondents experienced online copyright infringement. That's significant. I mean, that's a large percentage of, of people. This is the same figure when they undertook a survey during COVID, but also commenting on the fact that they were seeing a, a rise in cases. So, and it's interesting in the respect that as a professional industry, there are in excess a, at least a billion images available to license commercially in the UK. So why is there a problem? So most copyright infringement goes unchallenged and unreported. So due, due simply to the sheer scale of copyright infringement online, for many photographers, the cost of following up on copyright infringements can in many cases outweigh the benefits. There is a lot of time and administrative resources required to do so for each infringement. So of course, everybody would be far happier if we could just get on with doing business rather than having to deal with infringements. The industry report I referred to before showed that 64% of infringement levels actually increased over the last five years. <coughs> if we consider the fact that commission shoots, for example, during COVID was immediately halted, but what we did see was a significant rise in online business activity, which most likely required images to sell products. I think it's fair to say that keeping up with the sheer speed and scale of online infringement makes it very difficult for photographers to do much about it particularly with the closure of the IPEX small claims check during the lockdown period, which obviously was you know, inevitable in that respect. But those members who do use paid for image infringement identification services, bit of a mouthful, but um, they, they provide a particularly useful service because they actually identify images on um, a variety of different uh, social media platforms, as well as websites um, effectively trawling the internet, but they bring back and report on the number of images that they find. Seeing a rise in those cases is inevitable in that respect, but you still have the human element of being able to check all of those infringements. So effectively, if you've got a rise in cases, but you've still got one person checking through all of them, effectively, they're not going to be able to do that and not necessarily um, select ones that um, essentially don't have the same uh, value connotation as you would find with others. So, copyright infringement is an economic harm. 
I think it's important to, to stress that, um, again, referring back to that industry report, it showed that 25% is the average proportion of licensing revenue lost from online infringements. Now, for any <coughs> business, that's a sizable chunk. 25% of your business has gone through online infringements. And then if you equate that to the amount of time and resource to then take each case and consider whether you're going to pursue it further, that's a huge amount of time as well added in. The problem also is the perception of products um, is very different. So for example, bought from a shop and taking an image from an internet browser are markedly very different. No one would think of walking into a shop, just taking what you want and walking out again without paying anything for it. And then if caught, only being requested to pay a discounted sum back. There is a clear criminal process in this case. And yet online, taking images and using them for commercial purposes is perceived to be okay, almost normal. I mean, we all do it to a certain extent, but um, for personal use, not a problem. But obviously what we've seen with this rise is the fact it's also being exploited commercially to that extent. I remember actually having a conversation with one person um, using, um, so I was actually myself using these services, um, and one person had actually used one of our images and effectively uh, they'd, you know, because you have to show where the image comes from, they knew where, which picture library it came from, they approached, you know, us by phone and they actually admitted they'd taken the picture, used it without permission, not even licensed it, but their claim was that um, the photograph, which cost a few thousand pounds to actually shoot, was just an image. So there is that perception issue. Now, what I wanted to do was just give you a little bit of light entertainment by showing you some images. So these are a sample of, of some of our AOP photographers images. Um, I thought it would be helpful to show you this just to give you some kind of context in terms of the fact that they vary in style and yet all require significant investment, skill and expertise to capture the end result. And I think it's fair to say they shouldn't necessarily be treated as one size fits all. Um, and in fact, uh, in the far left corner at the bottom, the portrait of the bird, Tim Flack is, is our president. And that um, particular picture, in fact, his whole series of images that he takes of animals are all shot in a studio. He doesn't do it for every single picture. There are some taken in the wild, but the, the, the amount of time, effort and skill required just to get that shot where the bird is looking directly at the camera so you have that connection is, is quite extraordinary. I also wanted to show you this as an example of the average setup costs a photographer undertakes per shoot, noting that kit equipment can also change per shoot. So it's that first part where we're talking about standard kit, kit equipment investment is not necessarily fixed. It can change depending on whether you're shooting inside, outside, whether it's in a studio, perhaps it's still or moving images. Um, but also, of course, on top of that, you've got research and development, production costs and post work time. So that's where you're editing the, the images that you've, you've shot. Um, and bearing in mind, yes, you are going to be paid for that particular shoot. But at the same time, uh, you are putting in a huge amount of time and effort to do that. And the value of that is, is quite considerable. So we're looking at a, an average of £30,000. And the end result might be just one picture that's used five pictures, it's not necessarily that it's going to be a whole, uh, you know, the equivalent amount of, you know, 20 pounds an image, so therefore, you know, 20,000 images, for example. So, uh, the options available to creators are limited. So, I mentioned about these copyright infringement identification services, but they are paid for. So, therefore, um, you do have to pay as a uh, a photographer or as a uh, picture library to be able to use these services. So again, there's a cost element there. Um, and as I've already mentioned, the fact that you're having to actually spend time going through all of those infringements. If the infringement is relatively substantial for, for the photographer, and of course, uh, Colin mentioned about £400, to them it is still a sizable sum, because when you consider the amount of licensing that, that takes place, um, Effectively, in the marketplace, there are some that are sold on volume, which means um, you can reduce the unit cost, but an individual photographer 
400 pounds is a sizable amount of, of money. And I actually myself uh, supported a, a, a photographer through a particular case. It wasn't on copyright, it was a contractual issue, but it was for around the same sum. And she found the whole uh, process extremely nerve wracking. And, um, you know, it, it was, I felt pleased to be there to support her. Um, but of course, that's the, the IPEX small claims track for the value of less than £10,000. Um, the, there's no guarantee the photographer will receive full compensation for that investment in the value of their images as entirely dependent on the judge's perception of the case given the information provided by both parties. Um, and of course, one of the other issues is where perhaps the uh, it might be from the other party or it might be experience they've already had where they will refer to an external price guide by a picture library. It's not necessarily the value, the true value measure because in many respects it's used as a marketing tool to entice customers to come to that particular picture library so in many respects value is is it's not necessarily the true mark market value in that respect so you always have to consider that i think quite carefully and of course due to the complexity of online cases photographers often have to seek legal advice which can push the costs up over and above the £10,000 limit, meaning they either have to consider using the multi-track system, which can be financially prohibitive and with no recompense if the judge isn't in their favour, or simply drop the case, um, but losing any costs incurred leading up to that point. Currently, there isn't any provision for either an online simplified process or opting for minimum statutory damages. So, there are, of course, issues with... Um, those options. I've mentioned the image infringement services, volume, human um, checking, the amount of time and administration involved. With the IPAC um, small claims track, it's been hugely helpful to many photographers seeking to recompense for their theft of their work. And I'd like to acknowledge that because I think it's been fantastic in that regard. I think the general concern is that the cost of taking action continues to be perceived as disproportionate to remedies available but there is an opportunity to improve the system for everyone. So I'll briefly mention what these are and the possible solutions that we can consider. So currently the law provides for a claimant to choose between an accounting of profits or an award of damages. Electing for an accounting of profits precludes any additional damages and claimants will need specialist paid for uh, advice if pursuing this route, which of course, as I've said, may be prohibitive. Our members and our experience shows that the assessment of the level of quantum is often not at the level that the claimant seeks, despite having substantiated it. Uh, one solution which I think we heard, I heard earlier in the green th this evening, which I actually had in my notes here, was to create an online system to offer a low cost and simple way for rights holders to submit claims that would then not require a full court hearing, but could be dealt with in an administrative way by the courts. Uh, there's also where photographers take cases before the IPEC STC, any compensation, if they are successful, does not always reflect the value of the images, as I'd mentioned before. So um, on what the problem there, of course, is on what similar kinds of photographs in the view of the judges could be licensed for elsewhere. These outcomes have heavily undermined the value of claimants' IP, resulting in costs incurred far outweighing the levels of damages received. So what's the solution? Clear and improved guidance for IPEC STC plaintiffs on providing supporting evidence that establishes and distinguishes the value of infringed content. And also potentially provisions for judges to understand that there is a broad range of photography which has a varying degree of investment um, and each case should therefore be based on individual merit and not necessarily a price guide that's found online which has a different purpose in many respects. Um, also, there's a, currently no central depository that records the outcomes of cases heard by the um, small claims track. This makes it particularly difficult for rights holders to understand how decisions are made and whether there are precedents for cases they might want to bring before the court. A possible solution, develop a mechanism to record the results heard before the court that can be easily accessed by rights holders and, of course, um, those defending the claims too. Uh, the level of potential damages in the IPEC um, small claims track is £10,000. This remains low to, to a degree and reduces to a certain extent the incentive for rights holders 
because they don't want to go to the cost of pursuing a case through the multi-track. But potential damages available through the small claim track can be too low sometimes. So if you do have a complex case, you do have to approach um, a lawyer um, to go through that process. That's where you can see an increase in the cost, simply because they're trying to work out with you where the issues actually lie before you take it to court. So the £10,000 in compensation doesn't always take into account the cost of time and administration and that rights holders go through to take these cases. So possible solution, increase the level of damages um, in the small claims track. Not necessarily by a huge amount, but at least something a bit more significant. Um, of those members who do claim, about 50 percent of them report that a settlement is reached just after the issuance of court papers and before the date of a hearing, leaving a final 50% of them to pursue the matter further. Um, what I'd like to suggest is injunctive relief made available alongside debt advice and swift enforcement settlement outcomes. I think we would find it extremely helpful if there were to be considerations to improve and streamline the service given that we, we do um, utilise it a lot and appreciate its, its presence enormously. But obviously it would make it easier for all parties involved, as well as publishing some of the cases to act as dissuasories. And that's it. Thank you very much. Can I firstly thank UCL and uh, IPAN for giving myself and FSB the opportunity to make this short presentation. It's fairly rare for SMEs to have the ability to address such a select group of high-level intellects. And as I have a short time available, and in view of the presence uh, of some distinguished legal guests, I hope you'll forgive me if I, my topic range strays a little wider than pure IP topics. Um, we've had reference from uh, Lord Justice Burst to uh, to the Bible. I, I hope that you've not got the impression so far uh, that the micro business fraternity is not the sort of leper colony within the legal system. Um, I hope we'll persuade you that that's not the case. Uh, uh, but I think the answer to the question that you have on on the screen there is room for improvement. So by way of contextual starter, in the commercial field, IP rights and their enforcement usually serve two masters. That is the businesses who create and exploit them and the consumers who enjoy the reliable brand recognition and the attractive, safe and secure product ranges that, that, that uh, result. Most of what we do is essentially serving those two markets. And so I think it's with the current and future market needs and issues that really I need to focus. And my perspective, of course, is that of SMEs, and as you probably know, something over 90% of the businesses in number of businesses rather than size in this country are probably micro businesses, much smaller than the small, that is less than 10 employees, uh, where small is defined as 25 or less employees, uh, medium 50 and so on. Um, it goes up to 250, the category. Uh, so we're talking about the sort of issues that Isabel has outlined, and I share a lot of the views that she's expressed, uh, as you'll find out. So first then, a brief overview. Many SMEs need persuading that IP is relevant to them. But, as I keep telling them, every SME has a trading name, it has confidential know-how in terms of its suppliers, its customers, its employees, um, and that data to protect, um, and they commonly create copyright material, and they create databases of those uh, suppliers uh, and customers. And so they do all have rights, but they don't always appreciate it. Um, a lesser number of businesses um, will create copyright material, um, and some will create database rights in themselves. A much lesser, a smaller number than that will register trademarks, and a much smaller number than that probably will register or use design rights. And then the very small number will get into uh, the issues of patents. And the reasons for that are mainly economic, um, but pressure of time and lack of knowledge also play a part, as we all well know. So I'll illustrate some of the commercial and IP problems that arise for SMEs by starting with the online marketplace, uh, which is all pervading. Uh, many issues that SMEs face are practical rather than technical IP issues. If I describe the general marketplace first, then I'll touch on some IP aspects. So 21st century commerce needs 21st century solutions. That is the basic message that I'd like to put across. It's tried to say that the internet's transformed commerce during the last 30 years. In the first five or six months or so of the pandemic, from March to August 2020, an additional 80,000 businesses started operating online or on online platforms. And that has exponentially continued since August 2020. Um, 
people trading via websites or platforms, uh, and that extraordinary growth will continue from now on. However, once the explosion of online commerce has changed the established business practices over the last decades, the available mechanisms for resolving issues arising have struggled to cope with the new promotional, sales, delivery and payment systems, and especially with the pace at which that field of commerce operates. So what am I talking about specifically? Firstly, we have the issue of unreliable online IDs, and this affects IP, as I'll come to tell you. Both businesses and consumers buying online often struggle, surprisingly, to identify the party with whom they're contracting. Typically, the name of a selling business will often be buried deep within a privacy policy or within extensive, extensive terms and conditions if mentioned at all. The law requires a business's identity and nature to be stated on the website, but the law is rarely enforced. There should be a requirement for a clear statement on a website, home or landing page, uh, or online sales listing, identifying the name of the operator or the listing seller and their legal nature or status, so that you knew, know with whom you're contracting. Trading standards simply don't have the manpower to police that. They are the people who should be, but We've all been on websites and struggled to find out who it is to contact or who it is indeed that we're, we're actually communicating with at times. So, um, the relevance to IP, of course, is that an enormous number of completely fake websites exist on the internet and legitimate websites often sell infringing material produced or distributed uh, in, in territories where it's not permitted to be distributed. So although enforcement action closes some of those fake sites down, replacements often appear instantaneously almost. I mean, one well-known bank was taking down 50 fraudulent sites a week, emulating uh, its, uh, its particular offers. Um, and replica or pirated goods sales damage brands, so they damage the IP values for all the companies involved. And identification of the perpetrators is absolutely key to enforcement. So I think we need to do more about identification first of all. Um, I suggest that in addition to more extensive use of regulatory powers um, to secure the full and accurate online IDs, we need to look at some of the civil law procedures. And I suggest perhaps we should focus our attention on replacing the Norwich Pharmacal type of applications which are made uh, where costs can be an issue. Uh, there have been procedures within the Chancery Division in the past where dedicated masters have dealt with very finite and narrow areas. It's possible to envisage some sort of online process which is simple with uploaded uh, standard templates uh, in order to get information. Businesses need to know who these people are as quickly as possible. Sometimes it's to trace money, mostly in IP terms, it's to take down um, the perpetrators uh, who are selling fake goods or, or selling uh, uh, or infringing in some other way. Uh, so that's a conversation I'm quite happy to have in more detail uh, with the MOJ. Um, but I think that's an area that needs looking at because it's a bit clunky for 21st century commerce and I think it can be improved. So unfair commercial practices uh, is an area which affects IP, um, as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, listings on legitimate websites and online sales platforms often describe products in inaccurate and misleading manner and use data or metadata, both overtly and embedded, to drive internet searches to different websites or products from that which they were seeking uh, to look at. Those practices damage legitimate brands. That's where the IP damage comes in, and they damage online sellers who are honest. The details of platform listings are, of course, not checked by the platform operators. By defining some of these behaviours as unfair business practices and providing a simple remedy for those businesses adversely affected by breaches is, as is already provided in some European jurisdictions, I think Germany in particular, uh, what is required. Control by use of advertising codes and their enforcement is not really commercially viable, although that has been seen as partial solution in some cases. Uh, I don't think it can adequately address removal of the anti-competitive behaviours in question. So the UK government so far has focused on potential damage to consumers due to unfair business practices, whereas in many cases the damage is only suffered by another business. Um, and the competitor business uh, is the one who is normally affected by the unscrupulous behaviour. Um, so we need an effective business-to-business -business solution. We need a remedy available to SMEs. And by defining some of these offending behaviours as unfair business practices, as they do in Germany, uh, and providing businesses adversely affected with a right of action for compensation for those practices would put UK SMEs in the same protected position as some of their EU counterparts and would benefit legitimate brands and legitimate products.
So do we need new IP rights to solve some of these internet related problems? Uh, there is a potential uh, intellectual property related solution to some of the anti-competitive and unfair behaviors. The unfair use of data such as product codes, catalog numbers, uh, graphical devices such as barcodes and QR codes uh, by some unscrupulous traders uh, other than the business to whose products they relate are used to drive trade to their own websites. Sometimes these things are embedded, sometimes they're included in descriptions, but they very often appear uh, and it's very difficult to notice, but it's very difficult to do anything about it. Um, so it enabled, uh, sorry, it is enabled by the way in which search engines operate. It's very simply a product of how search engines behave. They find the data wherever it's embedded, wherever it's included on sites without discrimination. So such usage diverts the potential customers of the data and graphics owning businesses to the sales platform of the unscrupulous competitor. The IP problem is that the data and the graphical codes cannot usually be registered as trademarks, which would in any event be disproportionately expensive because of their number, and they don't easily qualify for copyright protection. So no IP infringement action is possible or easy at the present time, uh, and would be probably disproportionate in any event because of the circumstances. Um, one solution might be to create a unique business data ride. If they are your product codes, your barcodes, your QR codes, your catalogue numbers, and they're unique to you, should that information be protected in the same way as data rights, database rights were created some years ago to correct compilations? That's something I think we should give thought to, but um, it's probably not a satisfactory solution as looking at the unfair business practices uh, in a broader sense uh, and defining those things as unfair business practices rather than relying on a pure IP answer to the problem. So what about more clarity and guidance from the IPO? And I'm very pleased that Miles is here and I'm sure he's listening carefully. Um, not many SMEs have the ability to plough through legislation and case law in order to establish good practice. In many instances, regulation and case law describe what is permitted in fairly complex language but don't give straightforward examples of the principles being applied and it's practical advice that SMEs always value. For instance, it's increasingly common uh, for online traders uh, to have legally permitted descriptive or referential trademark usage questioned. If the IPO were to publish examples of fair use of trademarks for descriptive or referential purposes and of examples of infringing use, that would be extremely helpful to online traders and platforms. Reliance upon unjustified IP threats law is not really a solution where the scale and value of the issue is relatively small, as such action would be uneconomic or disproportionately costly. Theoretically, good, practically bad. So online IP infringement application uh, allegations. This is an area which is acknowledged to be increasing in scale, uh, and it's what I would term Wild West dispute resolution. Larger companies, and I'm afraid it is usually larger companies, have realized that if they want to suppress unwanted small business competition, they can use IP rights to do so. FSB has had a number of members whose websites or online platform listings have been suspended or deleted because of an allegation of trademark or patent infringement. The alleged rights holder makes a complaint to the ISP or platform operator who, not wishing to become liable itself, suspends the relevant listings. The listing business can protest, but if no agreement is reached, the, the default position is that the ISP or platform maintains the suspension and requires the parties to resolve their dispute between themselves. Now, this effectively means that the rights owner has obtained the equivalent of an injunction without proving its case and without having to go to court. The only availability uh, of remedy for the SME is to go to court, a step which, firstly, most SMEs can't afford, or in very frequent cases, it would be disproportionate to the value of the individual sales lost in the particular case. Uh, and this is the problem of scale really throughout what I'm telling you. Uh, this frequently occurs in the spare parts or consumables market where there's a consumer interest in having a, vibrate, a, vib a vibrant secondary market rather than a manufacturer's monopoly. Now, I understand the position is different in the USA and that where listings uh, are challenged in that way, they're not necessarily suspended and the onus is put on the rights holder to prove its case and that the uh, listings are not taken down in the same way as they are over here. So this is again something that we could look at, but it's a product of the law as it stands at the moment. 
the liability of the listings uh, and ISP uh, companies um, if an allegation of that sort has been made and they've not taken any action as a result of it. So if I can talk about online dispute resolution generally, um, I'll come back to dispute resolution uh, in other aspects in a moment. There's an urgent need for a fast and cost-effective dispute resolution. The mechanisms for requiring website hosts uh, and internet service providers, platform operators and so on, social media applications to act speedily effective to, to resolve issues is really a crucial area that needs to be tackled. The area was addressed by the European Union uh, by the Online Intermediation Services Regulation EU 2019-1150 which requires online sales platforms to have an internal complaints procedure and reference to mediators. The processes of most platforms are slow and opaque. The EU regulation was supplemented in this country by the Online Intermediation for Business Users Enforcement Regulations 2020, uh, but only certain breaches of the EU regulations are treated as breaches of duty, actionable in the event of loss or damage, and the only option for remedy is again via the courts and therefore beyond the means of most SMEs, and again, costs slightly to be disproportionate to the dispute in val dispute's value in any event. The platform processes are really unsuitable for resolving disputes with an IP content. Uh, and so I'll, I'll return to this dispute resolution issue in a moment. So turning then briefly uh, to trademark law. Um, trading names used by SMEs are often unregistered and can come into conflict with later registered trademarks. This creates un uh, unfair outcomes for the unregistered SME because of the technical requirements relating to goodwill in some cases. It raises the question as to whether the legal requirement as to trading name usage and its extent, or in relation to names which are descriptive, or in relation to distinctiveness, should be reconsidered and possibly changed. For example, an FSB member who had traded under a particular brand name for over 10 years in one or two specific localities subsequently found that a supermarket had registered the same brand name as a trademark and they, an issue arose um, despite unsatisfactory IPO hearings and IPO appeals. Uh, the member it concerned was unable to appeal or take it further to the High Court. Um, and even more irritatingly, not long after the expensive issue, the supermarket ceased producing products with the particular brand name, but has so far retained the trademark. Um, Interestingly, um, only yesterday there was a report in the paper of a similar sort of issue where a small business had been using a particular device. Uh, has anyone seen the Shrewsbury Donuts case? Um, basically, um, the Shrewsbury Donut manufacturer uh, had Shrewsbury Prison on his packaging. He had 75,000 packages made up with Shrewsbury Prison on it. Um, and he was about to continue selling, as he had done for four years, when someone who had three days beyond their trademark registration, who now own Shrewsbury Prison, uh, claimed that they'd infringed the trademark. Now, I'm not saying they had. Uh, there are obviously issues which everyone will pick up on that. But it's another example. Uh, the reactions that were reported in the paper were an example of the small business ignorance and how to deal with these particular problems, which appear on the face of them to be complex. Uh, and the necessary expense of obtaining advice and possibly getting involved in some sort of IPO procedures. Uh, I don't know whether opposition was a possibility or, or whether application to uh, take the trademark down. Those sort of things would obviously need looking at. But it's another example of small business ignorance creating an issue. Uh, and this person would have lost quite a significant amount of money if he'd had to destroy all his packaging. So two IP related questions arise about the trademark uh, issue I've just mentioned. First, should the current case law relating to extent of usage and actual accrual of goodwill or reputation be revised by legislation to better protect SMEs? Uh, it's been said there's no general law against unfair competition. I think that the position should change and that introducing a business to business unfair competition right is a better and more broad approach to simply tinkering with one aspect of pure trademark law. Uh, other countries, such as Germany, have civil law provisions enabling businesses to take unfair competition action. Um, and I think that we should follow that and that UK businesses should not be in a worse position. Uh, and at the moment, as I've said, UK law only protects consumers from businesses on an unfair business practices way. Uh, smaller businesses, especially micro businesses, need the benefit of similar protection. Secondly, the question is how you achieve access to justice in relation to trademark issues for SMEs who cannot afford to fund or risk the usual means of redress 
or where it would be too slow or disproportionately costly and time consuming to do so. So if small businesses are not sunk by IP related disputes, they may be weakened by them. And eventually, uh, if there is a repeated series of them, it can be a sort of death of a thousand cuts. And we have had members who've simply given up and not pursued their businesses because of these sort of issues that have arisen. Um, it's very damaging to the economy. Um, people who get away with it are emboldened to behave unfairly again, and that leads to uh, a watering down of the marketplace that's offered to consumers in respect of certain products, especially, as I say, in the spare parts and incompatible uh, areas. So I'd like to finish up mostly by talking about dispute resolution generally. Uh, and this does have an IP aspect, I assure you, but it is of more general application. So the problems with all dispute resolution are well known. Uh, and this is the infringement problem, of course, which uh, Isabel was outlining. Um, the challenge that SMEs face is the same. It's cost, it's delay, it's complexity and knowledge. And if we're in the 21st century, things are moving really fast. We have to change that. We can't just keep doing the same things over and over again and expect different outcomes. We have to look at it again and see what we can do about it. So justice delayed is often justice denied. The pace of 21st century commerce, especially the online commerce, and the speed at which significant damage can be suffered would be incredible to those who created our present dispute resolution system. So what is urgently required, I think, is a holistic review of dispute resolution without any preconceptions based on our current systems. We need to ask whether we can improve, not whether we can improve the current systems, but whether we need completely different processes and mechanisms for dispute resolution um, and delivery in order to increase access to justice and achieve acceptable levels of satisfactory resolution when measured against 21st century commercial criteria. Progress is being made by the Ministry of Justice and HM Court Service, but often the focus is on new mechanisms for delivery of existing processes rather than on potential um, improved new processes themselves. Advances in ADR solutions over the last 20 years are of course welcomed, um, but the take-up of ADR within business generally is still relatively low, and we need to examine the reason for that and, and cure it. Uh, the courts have embraced early neutral evaluation, which you're probably familiar with, sometimes called third-party neutral evaluation, but it's not truly early if it only arises as a possibility well after court proceedings have been issued and significant legal costs have been incurred, as those costs usually become a barrier to resolution in their own right. So a truly enlightened and effective dispute resolution system would be intervening much earlier. So you probably know some construction industry contacts provi contracts provide for dispute boards, which effectively anticipate difficulties and bring parties together to resolve them before the positions become entrenched. Yeah. We, yeah, okay. Um, I'll try and wind up then. Um, very briefly, if we follow the ACAS example of conciliation, if we follow the family law Miams example and other examples in other jurisdictions, what we need, I suggest, is a new look uh, at, firstly, a business dispute service, independent of the courts, so it doesn't frighten people away. And secondly, I think we need to look at whether we need a review of the current tribunal position. Does the IPO, the IPEC, uh, and the current copyright tribunal, do we need to look at those holistically and see what the right solutions are going forward for the 21st century? Uh, so as I've been called, called out there in time terms, I will leave it there. I could go on for some time. I'm happy to continue the discussion with anyone who's interested in those topics, but I think we need to look far more broadly at how we go forward with these sort of areas. So thank you very much for listening. I got the distinct impression, Neil, that you would have uh, been able to uh, uh, entertain us uh, for, for the rest of the evening. Um, and there are lots of things there that, uh, that I hope will come up in the further panel discussion. And I want to make sure that we, uh, we, we give that adequate time. Mediation ADRs come up. Um, we've got people here to, to address that. I mean, um, the, the format now is that uh, we'll, we'll have a panel discussion. We've got a very distinguished panel, and I'm now regarding this as an extension of our panel. So if questions come up that uh, uh, the, the people on my left here can, can address, we'll deem them to be part of the panel as well. But the, the, the actual panel here on my right, if I can briefly introduce 
uh, um, not necessarily in the order that they're uh, well. I'll, I'll I'll do it in the order that they're sitting in, uh, since that's easier. Uh, so on my immediate uh, uh, right is um, uh, has already been mentioned. Her honour, uh, district judge. Uh, oh, sorry, um, district <laughs> judge um, Charlotte Hart, um, who, as you've heard, is from the. Uh, 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 are you are you the are you in charge of the? Uh, small claims track, or are you not one? officially? Not officially. <laughs> I, think, I think we can. I think we can take. Good, yes. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, Charlotte is uh, is one of the judges, at least, of the small claims track of IPEC. Um, uh, um, Michael Silverleaf, QC, next uh, next to her, um, is uh, uh, a leading IP barrister with a wealth of experience in all kinds of IP cases I've worked with him for, for, for many years. But he's, he's also, um, uh, perhaps in more recent years, uh, been doing more and more mediations, um, both from the point of view of being a mediator uh, and, and representing parties in mediation. So we've had mention of ADR already. Um, uh, then we have Mandy Haberman, uh, she's a, a, a member of the board of IPAN uh, and an entrepreneur in her own right who's, see, who's seen herself um, how, the, how the IP system works um, in enforcing her own patents in the English courts. Um, and she may say some things about that. Um, Miles Rees, who's been mentioned, is, is the head of, given him his uh, official title here, is the head of enforcement outreach and stakeholder engagement. And you can tell us what that means uh, at the UK Intellectual Property Office. Um, and of course, the, uh, the, the IPO uh, grants many of the rights that we're, we're, we're referring to here. So I think uh, we, we, we definitely uh, wanted to, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for, to Miles uh, for standing in for, for one of his uh, colleagues who uh, I gather is, uh, has a good excuse for not being here. Nothing to do with COVID, he's away skiing. Um, and uh, um, Lee Davis, finally there, is the uh, chief executive of the Charles Institute of Patent Attorneys, SEPA. Uh, and that um, uh, SEPA manages and finances the IP pro bono scheme that you've heard uh, mentioned. Um, and uh, uh, Lee is, the, uh, is the, basically the boss of the um, well, I mean, I used to be pre I used to be president of SEPA, um, but I I knew who was running the show. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's our distinguished panel, and I, I'll start the ball rolling by asking some questions of them individually, uh, and we'll 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 see if that generates a dialogue. I'd like to encourage questions uh, from those of you who are here. I'm not sure whether uh, there's a facility for questions from the. Uh, you, those of you who are uh, um, watching uh, from wherever you are, um, unless you submitted questions in advance. But uh, um, I should have said, I think, uh, at the beginning, welcome to all of those who are, uh, uh, you were included, of course, in the general welcome uh, for being here. Um, and we'll see if we can get some questions going from the, uh, the floor. And you can sort of shout at your screens if you've got questions that you would like to have asked. So first of all, I'll ask um, Mandy. Um, you, you've, as I've said, you've had experience of the courts as an inventor, uh, protecting your own uh, inventions. And how did you feel from that that the IP system serves individuals and small businesses? And do you think there's been an improvement? I know you've been involved in many uh, discussions since then, but do you think there's been an improvement since your own experience? Yeah. Um, well, I think the microphone's probably. Uh, if you move it closer, that might be here. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so, I mean, my experience in going through the courts was in the late 1990s, and quite a lot has changed since then for the better. Um, and I, I know that, you know, small businesses, in my case, micro-businesses, um, getting involved with patents is probably well, is quite rare. Um, and then to end up enforcing your rights is possibly even rarer still. Um, and it was a, a horrendous ordeal at the time. Um, I needed, what I really wanted was a, an interlocutory injunction because I need, uh, speed is very important commercially. Um, if you're a small brand, if you get infringed, um, you need to stop the other side fast, otherwise you don't have a business left. And um, that meant that we ended up in the high courts 
um, but we were given a speedy trial, so that helped. So that experience in itself, the fact that we got a speedy trial, I think that helped enormously. And I think that um, with the um, enterprise and intellectual property and IP course, things are dealt with much faster and speed is a huge commercial um, factor in all of this. Um, the experience was horrendous and I had to risk my house, losing my house in order to do it. And I don't really think that anybody should be put in that sort of position uh, just because they happen to be creative and create rights and create products. Um, but on the other hand, I have to say the system did work for me, or maybe I was just lucky. I think the biggest thing um, I took away from it was the experience of when you're the little guy, you are so vulnerable until you've become established in the marketplace. So when you go to see companies to offer licenses or start to try and commercialize your product, that's when you get ripped off because they know that you've invested all your money to get into the point that you're at and you don't yet have revenue and a bigger company can come along. They've, they can act much more quickly. They've got the resources. They can bring products to market much faster. So, I mean, that's when you're, you're most vulnerable. And I don't think that that, has, that hasn't changed. Um, even though, you know, we've got small claims and all of this, I still think that it's there's a lot of game playing that goes on. Um, so yeah, that, that was my experience. Um, but I think things have improved because when, when I did my court case, I think the um, IP and Enterprise Court wasn't in a good place at the time and it had a huge backlog. So I don't think that would have helped me anyway. But now I think with IPO um, opinions on infringement and um, validity, I think that helps even if it's not legally binding. Um, and dispute resolution, mediation. I think the biggest problem is getting the other side to come to the table because when you're the little guy, you've got no teeth. Um, so that's that's what's really hard is how do you stop them? How do you get them to the table even if you're not going to go to court? It's my experience. So wait, wait, in your case, you had the right, you, you were in the high court, I think, at that yeah. time, weren't you? I don't know whether it was even before the uh, IPEC. Um, it may have been the Patents County Court at the time, but you were, you were enforcing a patent in the, in the high court. And um, I mean, now we have, I mean, things have moved on. So Patents County Court became IPEC, and then the IPEC uh, gave rise to the small claims track. And the thing about that is that, um, it's, it's designed, it says, in its guide there to be used by parties who don't have uh, legal representatives acting for them. And I wondered from, uh, if I could ask uh, Charlotte here, um, what, what's your experience of, of dealing with cases like that with unrepresented parties? And, and, and do you think the system works well for them in practice? I think um, my experience is variable um, because there, are, there is no one, there is no, uh, sorry, there's no, one sort of claim and there's no one sort of litigant in person. I think listening to Neil and Isabel, and perhaps particularly Isabel, there was a lot about that that sounded extremely familiar. So I think um, it is more difficult to identify solutions to these things than it is to really agree about the problems. Um, I think when parties get before the court, I think they, they probably still get a hearing that is a in-depth consideration of their problem. But I think there are difficulties in making sure that people actually can access that quickly and efficiently and that the procedures are simple enough for people to mm -hmm. navigate. And I think there are things that are going on which are definite steps in the right direction. So the Civil uh, Procedure Rules Committee is, is doing a simplification analysis 
of what can be done in relation to rules. And when I started practicing, I'm pretty sure that the white book was was <laughs> one volume, and it, it, it's now two volumes, and they're bits that are actually only on online. So law does have a way of of breeding more law and procedure definitely has a way of breeding more procedure and I think the new world that we live in in terms of technology does represent a real potential for simplifying that and uh, that's very hopeful. I think the problem I see for the IPEX small claims track is that we are a small part of a bigger system. So in the green room, there was discussion of the fact that, you know, if, if you had a, a claim, somebody had had a claim in relation to a winger of their car and somebody had come along and smashed it and it could be done online and it was a fairly simple process and that was great. And I think the system responds better to that in reform terms because there are an awful lot of wing mirrors. But it works for, I mean, there is the, uh, the money claim system. Yeah. If you've, got a, you've sent somebody a bill for something you've done for them or a product you've supplied and they haven't paid it, you can, you can fairly quickly enforce that as an online money claim. But uh, I think what, I, I, what I, I think you're saying is that there, there, there could be scope for the small claims track to provide uh, a, a simpler way of doing that in an IP context, but it isn't really there yet because from my experience of trying to help people with it, very often um, it, it, it's how to put, how to put your case in in to the court. Um, you know, you're, you're asked to sort of um, put in a statement of case. Now, for most uh, normal people who are not lawyers, you know, what's a statement of case? What is that? What do I, well, I write, I write an essay. He, I did this, then he did that, and then then he did that again, and then I told him not to do it. But he did it again, and it goes on like that. And that's, you know, not the sort of thing that you. And then you, you, you run into the problem of how do you yeah. explain to somebody how they're supposed to put that in in what we would call a pleading. And that doesn't mean much to. No, and, else, and you know, why would somebody, you know, why would a photographer? Yeah think to themselves, well, these are the basics of, of, of copyright law that I need to go through. Mm. If there was a, a, a platform there that took them through it, then it would happen automatically. And I think the challenge is that the court system is moving in that direction. But how far does a generalised damages online platform respond to what the photographer pursuing copyright mm. would need. Now, so Colin may know the answer to that question because I, I, I don't, and I, but that seems to me the area we're kind of moving into. Yeah, if it was a case where the photographer could send a bill, photograph 500 pounds, and then if that bill wasn't paid, they could, they could sue on that bill. That's one way of doing it, and people sometimes do that, don't they? But if, if it's a trademark infringement, you can't really send a bill for trademark infringement. First of all, you've got to prove that the trademark's been infringed. But anyway... Do um, hmm? <laughs> Go on. Colin's going to tell us the answer. <laughs> well, funnily enough, there is an answer. Um, what we are looking at right now is to solve exactly this problem, or not specifically the copyright problem, but the problem of... Of a, of a large number of different kinds of civil claims and how you deal with that is to delegate it and make it someone else's problem and then solve it. And what I'm talking about is a system which has the luxuriates in the name of a blue tick. And what we do, the, the, the idea is that we have a generalized front end of an online damages system for civil justice with a specification of what the data set is that you need to file and then a series of protocols for um, pre-action dispute resolution systems, which people can run. And then if you, if you want to run a pre-action IP dispute resolution system, if you comply with the relevant protocols, it will be certified. The litigants will use it. 
the data will be put into that system, set up to, to generate to, 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 to capture the right data, and then if if the case doesn't isn't resolved in, the, in that dispute resolution system, the data is all there and can just simply go to the court, and no one has to write a particular claim, and that will solve exactly your problem. You heard it here first. If we can make it work, it would solve it. So that, that certainly would be. A, uh, I think we have. Another Lord Justice in the audience here who would like to uh, contribute a thought. So we've come to a, an important point. Uh, I don't think we've, I don't think we've got mic. microphones for you. So, uh, oh, it's okay. It's picking you up. Richard Arnold, go ahead. So we've come to an important point, which is combining Charlotte Hart's point with Colin Burst's point. All right. So the way that this system will work is analogous to the way the road traffic accident portal works. It deals with hundreds of thousands of claims each year. It deals with the Windmere example. And it is, first of all, ADR. And if you don't settle, then you go into the county court system. It's very successful. The question is, who funds it? Because the road traffic accident portal is funded by the insurance industry. Mm. So the question is, if we set up an IP portal as a front end to online courts, which is obviously the way to go, you need to find someone to fund it. Question for the panel, who's going to fund it? The answer to that is extremely easy. It's a levy on big business. Mm. Can, I, can I provide an answer? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> as long... the the <laughs> right. A short answer. Very short answer. The government's own research shows that disputes cost uh, businesses something like 20 billion a year. Um, we should be engaging with beasts, not just the midget. MOJ and saying to them, because the economy is suffering to that extent, they must put money behind these initiatives to make them work. And then you wake up. I did have a supplemental about that, um, but I think, I think I'll, I'll, let's let's come back to it. Let's move on to um, alternatives, other alternative solutions such as mediation. Michael, what, what do you think that in in your experience that mediation is a practical alternative to the sorts of cases we've been discussing today? Well, I'm very, I'm very conscious of the fact that my um, career trajectory was more like Collins than other people's. And I have relatively little experience, almost no experience, very small disputes. So I'm conscious that I'm speaking from a position of extreme ignorance. Um, ADR is obviously an important aspect of any dispute resolution system because if you can bring the parties together, an experienced mediator, whether in person or online, can often get them to a resolution that they wouldn't have thought of on their own. Um, but as Colin said and has been emphasised by everybody who's spoken since, this is all about process. And it needs to be built in as part of any process that's designed for particular types of claim. And the kind of ADR you'll want will, I think, depend entirely on how the process works. So the sort of mediations that I do tend to be in larger cases where you can sit the parties down and spend a significant period of time, uh, for want of a better description, bashing their heads together. Uh, and frequently, that generally, that results in a settlement either on the day or shortly afterwards. But the kind of disputes we're talking about, the sort of ADR you need is much simpler, quicker, and semi-automated, I would have thought. It needs to, there needs to be a very quick, dirty process for getting the parties to engage with each other. Uh, and one other general point I would make, which is outside ADR, is my view has long been that, uh, and, and it's been totally reinforced by everything I've heard this evening, that one of the major deficiencies with our legal system is that because legal rights are complicated and important, we, re we require our legal system to investigate and produce a perfect result, or what we think is a perfect result. The reality is that no dispute resolution system is perfect. And in many, many cases, rough and ready justice produced quickly and at low cost, even if some of the time it's wrong, is a better outcome. As a follow-up almost to the previous point, 
Um, Lee, since I want to make sure I've used all my panel members before we sort of have a free for all. Um, it's some of the discussion seems to be uh, if, if we if we can get a system where we don't need lawyers um, because it's so easy you can do it yourself. Then you know, apart from the fact that a lot of the people in this room will be out of a job, I mean that that would be the best course. Um, but the practical uh, side of that at the moment is that parties who find themselves on one side or other of the IP legal system will usually when they address themselves to IP pro bono, they'll say, well, I've been told that it will cost hundreds of pounds to write a letter and thousands and thousands of pounds if I get involved in actual legal proceedings. Now, this is where pro bono comes in. Um, and the question is, should uh, legal services in some way be provided for free for people who find themselves in that situation? And why is it that legal services should be provided for free when you don't get your rent for free or your photocopying for free or anything else for free, but you get your legal services for free. And what's the role that the professional bodies should have in that? Or, as we've heard already, should somebody else be funding it, i.e. maybe the government? Thank you for asking me an entirely different question to the one you prepared me for. Well, it's, more <laughs> <or less. laughs> it's, it's more or less the same <laughs> question. Thank you so much. Uh, it's delightful to be out doing business with you again. <laughs> it's difficult to look up and see other faces rather than your own one. Yes, I, I can't quite get used to this new world I'm, I'm in. So I got on a train this morning for the first time in a very long time. And, um, and I got Twitter out, as I do. And I wasn't expecting to get any sort of intelligence that would happen this evening. And the first tweet I saw... Um, was it was a conversation between a number of solicitors. And uh, I've written some of it down. I'll, I'll just pick out the, the bit that really struck me. Um, they were talking about, one of them was talking about being in the golf club and overhearing an ex-client talking about them and not, not, under, not really knowing that they were being overheard. Said, and the ex-client said, I bet they even used to charge me for telephoning me. And that sort of captured it for me because I thought you were going to ask me the question about whether the service is adequate and kind of cost effective and so on. I might ask you that next. You might, you might, yeah, so, so I'll answer it now because I'm doing, I'm doing the politician thing, obviously. Um, what it did for me was to kind of expose that chasm that exists between those who provide legal services and those who need them. And they would answer the question very differently. And those who provide legal services would say, I'm an expert, it's my time, of course I should charge for it, so on. And those who need to access legal services would say, oh, blimey, this is expensive, you know, this is cost prohibitive, I, there's no way into this for me. Um, and I wanted to answer this question in two parts, if I may, mm. because we've only so far touched on the important bit of what happens when it all goes wrong and it gets contentious. There is, of course, a, the, the other end of the equation, which is how we get people into the IP system in the first place. And I, I actually think we do quite well at the latter part. Um, if we talk about SEPA members and if we talk about SIPMA, the trademark equivalent, um, we offer clinics, members of the public, Sing, single inventors, people who are trying to build businesses can come along and get that first advice about how they might protect their rights for free. They can do that also through university clinics. Our members very often will give half an hour, 45 minute sessions to the public to, to get them into the system. And I know the IPO does a huge amount as well around um, access to advice for people who are, who are new to the system. So I don't, want to, I don't want to beat the system up all of the time because I think in some aspects we get it right. But the crunch, of course, comes when you need to enforce those rights. And I think that's, that's been the, the, very much the focus of, uh, of this evening when things get contentious. And I was reminding myself on the train that these are always business-to-business -business relationships, even if we're talking about one individual against one individual. They're business-to-business -business relationships. And you could answer this question terribly unfairly and say, well, if you can't afford the cost of maintaining your rights, defending your rights, enforcing your rights, um, then you don't have a business. But that's not the right answer. That can't be the right answer. In the way Mandy spoke about it, in the way that Colin spoke about it earlier, we can't be um, excluding so many people from the legal services system. So, so we've got to get over this prohibitive sort of system that we have in place. Um, you know where I'm going with this. We, we, of course, have worked, played long and hard at trying to establish a, a pro bono system for, for IP, IP advice. Um, call it a parachute system, call it a safety net, whatever, however we might term it. It's for those people who find themselves caught up in the system, either 
because they're facing litigation because they're being accused of infringing the right, or because they've built up a very small business and they don't have the ability to enforce those rights. To, to come into a system whereby legal professionals will provide a big part, if not all of that support, free of charge, um, pro bono. The, the reality is it's blooming difficult to get professionals to do that for a range of reasons. Um, in their firms, they al may already do pro bono work. It might be limited to charities. It might be limited to, right. to not-for-profit companies. It's not targeted at the small single inventor, the small on entrepreneur. Um, so, so I think you answer your question two ways, Steve. If you answer it from a, the legal systems perspective, you might argue it's kind of doing enough and it's about businesses being businesses. If you answer the question from the small business perspective, this is wholly unfair, isn't it? We, we, need, we need a better, better system. We've tried to develop something through IP pro bono that's there. It can't, can never be enough. We're, we're seeing that the demand is too much. And we need, we need I think, a more sophisticated, more um, detailed conversation in the IP legal professions about how we make access to justice true and fair for everyone. Yeah, and there is definitely demand there. I mean, I can, you know, we haven't got time to go into it here, but, you know, the, 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 and, and I had, a, I had a, a supplemental, which was on the sheet that I asked you about, uh, and I'll just, before I come to Miles, just say, do, do, do you think the professional bodies or, or oh, the regulator yeah. have got a role in ensuring that unrepresented parties are treated fairly by professionals representing larger entities. Now, I say that because I've seen a few cases where, in my humble opinion, um, you know, letters have been written which have been um, perhaps not quite fair in the way they've put their cases. I'll, I'll limit myself to saying that. Um, but it's very difficult to know what to do about that, apart from get somebody else on the other side to beat them up about it which is sometimes difficult. So I think the first thing that I would say is that if we look at the regulatory system in, in IP, certainly on the sort of patent attorney, trademark attorney side, the regulatory system isn't just there for the clients of attorneys, it's there for those who also experience the, the work and effects of attorneys. Yes. So if you are an uh, unrepresented uh, litigant in person, uh, it doesn't mean that there isn't redress through the regulatory regime for you if you feel that you are in a position where... Um, when you've been unfairly treated. So I think it's important to say that. So unrepresented individuals are outside of the regulatory regime. But actually, um, I, I, I spoke to a couple of attorneys about this and they would say, well, we kind of write in a particular way. We kind of express ourselves in a particular way. We're in this adversarial sort of um, kind of atmosphere and, and that's, that, that's us being professionals. So, so they might see that they're doing the right thing in the way that they make their case to litigants in person. And the litigants in person, the unrepresented person, would not even be able to understand the language. So they're, so from a professional, so never talk from a professional body perspective, I think my big take out from this is we've got to help professionals understand that when they're in a relationship that isn't business to business, when it is IP professional to um, litigant in person, unrepresented person, you need to modify language, you need to modify style and approach. You don't want to find yourself in a position of conflict. It's in your interests to do that. So, so I think I've learned something just yeah. through the preparation for this, but there, there, there is a place for us in terms of trying to help professionals understand how they can work better with people who are, who are not represented. So turning to, thank you, Lee. So turning to uh, uh, Miles from the point of view of the IPO, who are at the center of quite a lot of this, I mean, you do get quite a few um, applications nowadays from unrepresented applicants, particularly, I think, um, I, what I'd be interested to know is you're seeing a, a, an increase in that in, for example, trademarks, perhaps patents is a different uh, uh, area, but for trademarks and designs, are you getting an increase in the numbers of uh, unrepresented people there? And, and, and how do you feel the system is coping with that? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the numbers, um, pat patents is uh, pretty low. So, I mean, if I look at the last five years, the sort of stats I've got, um, the last two years are skewed because you have to obviously have an address for service now since EU exit, and that may be skewing figures because um, the number of represented... Bear in mind, this is not necessarily professionally represented. Mm. This is you tick the box, 
there might be a mate in the pub who, who's an expert or, or someone <laughs> who can sort you out. But just in, in terms of pure numbers, so the highest 2018 designs were 77% unrepresented. Um, patents highest was in 2020, 17%, but it's normally around sort of 13, 14%. And trademarks, um, yeah, 2020 was 58%, but around the mid 50s. So it's quite, more than half the Would you say 70? 77% for, for designs. For designs, 77% yeah. are unrepresented. A huge, a huge percentage of designs are unrepresented. I mean, that leads me to the question I, uh, I warned you about yeah. uh, earlier, which is that, are you really making it too easy for people to get these well, rights? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then, you know, what on earth can you do with them afterwards? Particularly, I think that applies to designs. I mean, you just file a yeah. picture of something and you get a, a registered design. I mean, we do a lot of work to try and help people file, to keep it as simple as possible, to help them navigate the process and the process. That there are more and more tools coming on stream that will assist, you know, things like series objections, which is still quite a high percentage, but, but things like classification, which for years has been a problem, and the new AI stuff is helping that. Um, do we make it too easy? It's difficult, because I think once you get to registration, I think people assume that, that once you've got a right and a certificate, and I've been in the IPO long enough to remember when we used to seal the certificates manually, um, and the numbers we get now, you know, you just you wouldn't want to do that, obviously. Um, so it, 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 it is quite difficult. I think people assume that, that there is a system in place that will protect them once they acquire a registered right. Mm. And, and a lot of them think it's the police and trading standards. <laughs> so the vast majority of letters that I deal with that come, not to the IPO, but they come via the minister, will be saying, I'd like the police to deal with my uh, uh, the photograph or, or whatever. Mm. Now we, we fund the police crime unit to the tune of the best part of three million pounds a year, but the best one in the world, they don't, they don't look after individual photographers. It's just the scale of things we wouldn't be able to. So um, it's difficult to answer. I'm not going to say that you know, we get too many. It, it, the numbers are massive. I mean, the growth in applications is absolutely yeah. extraordinary for trademarks. It's, it's, you know, I, I think the number is 90,000, and it's, it, it, it's gone massively in the last couple of years. And, you know, so it is a dilemma to discourage people to file or to understand their responsibilities once they file. I always think of that. We had, when I was an examiner years ago, um, Walker's Crisps launched the, the Salt and Lineker oh, yeah. type of crisps. We had about six applications for Smokey Beckham. We take well, the fee. That's a, that's we're that's a, 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 a public sector pension to fund. But, but <laughs> no, joking aside, you, you, we want to try and help applicants to understand the process and understand the responsibilities. It's, you know, we, someone once said to me, it's like owning a house. You, wouldn't, you don't go to bed with all the windows open. There, there's a little bit of responsibility once you have that right. But, but it is difficult for, because the vast majority of people don't get infringed and certainly don't have criminal infringement. So, so it is a very small percentage that run into these problems. Most people use the right and it's very effective. But, um, it, yeah. <laughs> I want to throw this open to the, the floor now. Before I go, just say quickly that there's a link between... Uh, what you just said about the registration of um, designs, I had no idea it was high as 77%. And what um, uh, Neil had said about the um, uh, people making claims that then end up removing the business from of the platform, such as yeah. Amazon or Etsy yeah, yeah. or something like that. And I mean, you know, you've got a small business, their entire business is selling their stuff through these online platforms. Yeah. Somebody... Uh, they can even, I think, you know, almost like copy the other person's design, purport to register it, yeah. and then strike them off. Yes, I mean, and, I mean, there's a there's there's a, there's a whole issue there. I mean, one of my ideas for this thing, I would have rather liked to have had somebody from one of those platforms here, but you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, let's see if there's uh, questions from the, the the floor, gentlemen at the back there. Sorry, I don't know. Um, so, can the IP systems serve small businesses better? For me, bifurcates into two parts. The first is reducing the barriers to entry for small businesses, and I think we've talked a lot about that tonight, thank you. Um, the second is, are the IP instruments fit for purpose for small businesses? And for me, that's far more of an important point. Um, are you a see, small business person as opposed to a lawyer? I, I am a small business Good. person. I am a lay person. In Good. Small I'm business. glad so, we've uh, got <laughs> uh, from that perspective. And uh, I, I think that there are some really key points to this. We're, we're seeing data -driven, a lot of data-driven businesses. 
There's a lot of confusion over cyber um, law where exactly the, uh, the, the rights can be enforced. Um, there's uh, furthermore uh, confusion over the AI issue, um, uh, which needs to be addressed. And uh, there are other uh, areas. We've seen a decline in the use of patents in the US uh, market, about 8% last year. Uh, we've seen the increased use of trade secrets and the directives in Europe and the US. Um, are we really creating the right IP system for small businesses now? Or is this a really old system that needs change? Anybody want to have a, a, a quick go at that one? Colin, I'll nominate you. <laughs> <laughs> Seniority. <laughs> or whatever. I mean, I, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer, really. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether I agree or not. Um, I mean, obviously, um, putting more emphasis on trade secrets, you can see why that might discourage people from using patents. Problem, there's all sorts of problems with that. Now is the time to get into that. I think that would be a retrograde step myself. The patent system is quite well calibrated. I'm not suggesting it's perfect. It can always be changed. But the whole point of it is you give somebody something, a monopoly right, in return for them giving you something, you being the public, which is you find out what the secret is. And if we drive everybody into a world of trade secrets, I think that's extremely uh, unfortunate. Uh, it's also not as much protection as people think it is, because you then copy it. <laughs> you can reverse engineer it, and your trade secret isn't worth anything. So that, that's my reaction to that. Um, <laughs> As far as things like AI and cyber and, and whatever, I mean, honestly, it's not obvious to me that there are actually real ambiguities about, that relate in a broader sense to intellectual property arising out of that. But if there are, bring, bring them on, let's sort them out. I mean, there's a, a famous decision in which Lord Justices Arnold and Burst didn't agree with each other about <laughs> micro detail <laughs> relating to AI, but I don't think it's very interesting. Uh, no, I and, thought it was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but that, you know, that, that's, that's the best I can do to answer your question. I suppose the next question we ought to ask is, we've gone over time, so uh, do you want to have some more questions or do you want to have a drink? That's the way Robin would formulate no, the question. No, I wouldn't ask the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, a hand up there and there. We'll have those two questions and then, uh, and then it'll be time for, for drinks. Please. Can I ask a question to the panel about uh, trial by social media, whether this is a help oh. or a hindrance to small businesses, and whether it's time to have a new Collins law perhaps to address the issue where the business model of a particular business is to infringe the rights of a brand owner? I think I know what you mean. I mean, that's, uh, if I can put it another way, it's is if you say trial by social media, is that slagging one another off on social media. Um, and How it see, interacts with the IP right, system. Right. I'm not sure it, it, it does per se, but um, it, it's certainly something that a lot of people resort to. Um, but does anybody else have any experience or comments on, on that trial by social media? Michael, you look as though you're about well, to say something. <laughs> I, do, I have a single experience of a tradesman I use asking me what to do about it. And um, my advice to him was talk to the customer and persuade her to take the post down. And he did, and she did. But, you know, that wasn't legal advice, that was just sort of good, honest common sense. It was a whole issue of fake, fake reviews. As well, yeah, it, it was basically it mediation. I think, and one more question over there, I think. Uh, yeah, my question was, um, earlier this evening, there was a mention about having an IP portal that would, if I understood right, enable claimants to enter their data and about their claims. That was... And um, so there was a, a question raised about how funding could be obtained to make such a portal. It occurs to me that, um, a question for the panel, could there be some revenue from the data in that portal? Because it's obviously very valuable in the age of machine learning. I thought you were going to offer us some funding personally. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure uh, anybody put a comment. You mean, you mean monetizing somehow the data in the, yeah. Is there um, an obligation for the government to make that data open? Within every other country, all the litigation databases are, are open. I 
I think you've stumped this learned learned panel. No, there isn't, and there isn't in other countries either. <laughs> Whatever they're supposed to be by rights of law, given by the Human Rights Act and the Human Rights Convention, you get what you get what, what governments put into it. But it's not all green on the other side of the channel. OK, on that note, I think there will be ample opportunity to carry on the discussion. I hope if you're able to stay, there are going to be drinks outside, aren't there? Um, and uh, I hope as many of you as possible will stay. I'd just like to uh, also thank all of the uh, people watching on the live stream. I'm sorry we can't offer you a drink. Maybe you can uh, arrange that yourselves. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to our panel and to our speakers, and to our keynote speaker, and to UCL, and Sir Robin, and Lynn, and Lisa for putting this on. And thank you, uh, and good night, and see you for a drink. <laughs>